we establish that salvation is not a reward salvation is a gift so when you read the bible and you see those scriptures that talk about well done good and faithful servant and all of that those are not scriptures that are connected to salvation those are scriptures connected to reward because salvation is not a reward nobody can earn it nobody deserves it the book of ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith you are saved by grace not by works you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god salvation is a gift salvation is not a reward it is after we are saved that now whatever service we render as people that are saved will be rewarded it will be rewarded by jesus christ well some people will have reward and some people will not have reward that's what the bible teaches us and those that will not have reward are those who didn't serve or those who served but didn't serve with right motives or right hearts they didn't serve in love they served for human praises they served for human recognition or they served out of competition or other reasons but if it is service unto the lord and the motivation is christ himself then christ will reward you for serving him so that's where reward came then we began to look at what can undo salvation we took time to deal with that we said number one sin cannot undo salvation because salvation is the cure for sin number two lack of service cannot undo salvation because you are not saved because you serve you are saved because you believe in the sacrifice of jesus number three we said this obedience in the church cannot undo salvation because it is not because you obey the church that you are saved but then of course the bible says if you are not obedient in the church when your pastor will give account of you before God, he will do it with grief and it is not profitable for you. Then we say false doctrine also will cause you to make shipwreck, but it is not required to save you. The fact that somebody is in false doctrine or teaching what is not scripturally right doesn't mean he will, not, he will lose his salvation. You know, um, he may wreck his faith. It will affect the way you will live on earth. You may not live a victorious life. You may not live a life of comfort. You may not live a life of victory in Jesus. You know, because you lack clarity of understanding. Remember, God doesn't just want you to be saved. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is a place called the knowledge of the truth. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Then we began to talk about holiness and we looked at a few scriptures because we are dwelling in the book of Hebrews because most of the misconception about the doctrine of salvation are taken mostly from the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, we saw there that it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctify it and they who are sanctified are all of one. Can somebody shout, I am sanctified? Can I hear you shout it very loud? I am sanctified. Somebody shout, I am called to glory. The glory of God is upon my life. All right, so you are sanctified. Both he that sanctify it and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So number one, you are sanctified. Number two, Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So he calls you holy brethren. The word holy is a Greek word, hagios. It means sanctified or set apart. We are described as holy in Hebrews 3, 1. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. We which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. When you believe in Jesus, you enter into rest. To enter into rest means to cease from works. That means I'm no more doing anything to be saved, but I am doing all I am doing in the kingdom of God because I am already saved. 
I have entered into rest. So I have ceased from my works. I'm no more doing things to qualify. He qualifies me. So whatever I do, it is because he has already qualified me. You believe, you enter rest. And if you don't enter rest, you do not believe. And if you do not believe, it means you're still in works. And by the works of the flesh shall no man be justified. So you've got to accept what Christ has done. When you accept what Jesus has done for you in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Because he didn't do it for himself, he did it for you. When you receive what he has done, then you can enjoy the fullness of every benefit that came out of his death, burial, and his resurrection. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Somebody shout, I have a great high priest. You already have the high priest. You're not going to have. You already have the high priest. The word high priest means a mediator. You have a mediator. Now, listen carefully. There are some places you will read in the book of Hebrews where he will say, he will say, let us come with a full assurance. Let us come. When he said, let us come, he is not talking to the person that already has the high priest. So as we read the book of Hebrews, you need to take note of tenses like if, like, you know, um, we have, like us. You need to take care of those grammatical expressions because they mean a lot in Bible interpretation. And I also have established that for you to be able to interpret the Bible very carefully, you must take note of the text, the context, the pretext, and the posttext. Because if you're not contextual in your understanding of the scriptures, your interpretation will be wrong and your application will be wrong. And that's what has been the problem in the body of Christ over the years. The problem in the body of Christ is that a lot of people do not understand how to interpret the scriptures. So they have made the scriptures say what the scriptures didn't say and religion has been built around that. Religion, a lot of religion has been built around that. So there is a form of godliness, but no power. Because the power is in the accurate understanding of the mind of God in the scriptures. Now it's important for you to understand that the scriptures testify of Jesus. The Bible tells us in John chapter 5 verse 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. The scriptures don't give eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. So the scriptures are a testimony of the Christ. They testify of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus did not come to do the will of God. Jesus came as God. Jesus didn't come to talk to us about God. He came to reveal God. He's not the messenger. He's the message. The scriptures testify of me. Search the scriptures. In the book of Luke chapter 24 verse 25, he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All that the prophets have spoken. What have the prophets spoken? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? The message of the prophets of the Old Testament is about the Christ. That Christ will suffer and out of the suffering of Christ, glory will follow. Then beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Is the message of the scriptures. So the, the Bible is a Christocentric book and it carries with it a Christocentric message. It's centered on Christ. It's the message of Christ. The Bible is the message of Christ. It's not the message of how to make it in business. It's not the message of how to have a healthy life. It's the message of Christ. The Bible is not a motivational book. The Bible is a spiritual book. It's the message of Christ. Amen. Look at Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things, somebody shout, all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, 
concerning me. I am the message of the law. I am the message of the prophets. I am the message of the Psalms. I am the message. The scriptures testify of me. So until you understand Christ, you have not understood the scriptures. So you already have a high priest, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. We have an anchor. And we said that the job of the anchor is to stabilize the sheep. The sheep don't hold the anchor. The anchor holds the sheep. Jesus is the anchor. He holds you. And he said, when I hold you, nobody can take you out. When I hold you in my hand, nobody can take you out. He is the Savior. Hallelujah. 20. Without a forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is made a high priest not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is our high priest. Can somebody shout, Jesus is my high priest. So we have something that brings stability to our minds. What is it? Jesus. Jesus stabilizes our minds. That anchor is a person. Jesus. He steadies us. So I am not the one holding Jesus. Jesus is the one holding me. He holds me. And he says, nobody can take you out. I have you covered. Amen. So, are those scriptures very clear? Alright. Hebrews 7.22 By so much was Jesus made a shorty, the guarantor of a better testament. Jesus is the guarantor or the shorty of a better testament. What is that testament? The new testament. Hebrews 7.25 Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is able to save forever. Somebody say, Jesus saves forever. Can I hear you shout it very loud? Jesus saves forever. When Jesus saves you, you are saved. Exactly. He saves to the uttermost. He does not save for some time. He saves forever. And he is the savior. You are not the savior. When you receive him, he saves you. And when he saves you, it is forever. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Save for how long? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey. That word obey is the word believe. All them that believe. Let me ask all of you a question. Who is the author of eternal salvation? Jesus. Who is the author? Is he the author? He's the author. He's the author. He's the author. The author is the finisher. Who is the author? Who is the finisher? So Jesus authored it. Jesus finishes it. You have no part to play. He saved you. He keeps you. And he presents you to himself. Without spot. I'm teaching here. Yeah. He's the author. He's the finisher of faith. He's the savior and the keeper. Hebrews chapter 8 deals with a contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you know, like I said, uh, the book of Hebrews is the message of Jesus. Past, present, and future. So, the book of Hebrews opens up Christ. And like we said, uh, the audience that were in address with this message were the Jews. The believing Jews and the non-believing Jews. That's why there will be a lot of typology in the book of Hebrews. When we talk about typology, we are talking about types and shadows, which were pointers to the Christ. 
That's why the Old Testament is a book of types and shadows. Because everything in the Old Testament was a pointer to the Christ. So when the writer of Hebrews was addressing the Jews, the whole book of Hebrews is Jesus in different types and shadows and substance. Alright, so Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1, let's look at this uh, comparison that the writer is making. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth he should not be a priest. Seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle fall, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now, 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 not in Moses' time, now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry than Moses because this is comparison between Moses and Jesus. Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry than that of Moses. Hallelujah. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. When you see the word better, it's not good, better, best. What it means by better is in comparison between Jesus and Moses, what Jesus has given to us is better than what Moses gave them. What did Moses give them? Moses gave them blood of goats and animals. What did Jesus give us? His own precious blood. So the blood of Jesus and the blood of goats, which is better? Jesus. So it's comparison is made in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was powered by the blood of animals. The New Testament is powered by the blood of Jesus. The Old Testament, the priesthood were men that died. The New Testament is a living priest of an endless life. So it's comparison that is going on here in the book of Hebrews between the Old and the New Testament. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So that first covenant was with faults. Now the question is, does it mean that God made a covenant that was not perfect? No. So always pretext, post-text, context. So the Ten Commandments and the law of Moses were all a description of the righteousness of God. So what was the fault then? If the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments were all a description of the righteous standard of God. Where is the fault? Well, look at verse 8. So you see where the fault is. For finding fault with them. For finding. So the fault in the Old Testament was with the people that were under the law. When the law was given, the law exposed the faults in the people. The law exposed their faults. So the mission of the law was to show man his weakness, his inability, and his failure. So that man can look for a savior. So the Old Testament didn't have fault. But the Old Testament found fault. It found fault. Romans 5.13 tells us, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Sin is not logizomai, that's the Greek word, when there is no law. 
So the mission of the law was to keep every man quiet and that the whole world may be guilty before God to expose the weakness and the inability of man to meet the righteous requirements of God. Amen? So the law was meant to make people guilty. So what is then the need for the new covenant? The new covenant will not find fault. That's the need. If the Old Testament was good in finding fault, there will be no need for the new. So if the problem with the Old Testament was that it found fault, so and because it was finding fault, there had to be an abolishing to set up the new, then if the new comes and find fault, then what is the need for the new? I'm teaching here. The need for the new is that when the new comes, it will take care of the faults. So the New Testament came to take care of the faults that the Old Testament exposed. I'm teaching. Look at verse 8 of Hebrews. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Why? For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So the Old Testament finds fault. The New Testament will not find fault. Why? Because all the faults of the New Testament are punished on Christ. So the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is Jesus. That's the difference. Jesus. In the Old Testament, Jesus didn't die, but animals died foreshadowing Christ. In the New Testament, the death of Christ gave us the New Testament. His death gave us the New Testament. If he didn't die, there will be no New Testament. <laughs> you know, many people are struggling with this. And for me, this is kindergarten. Many people, as I travel around the world and preach this and help the church to understand what the scriptures really mean, a lot of them are still struggling because religion has entered them so much that it is very difficult for them to see beyond their religious veil. And until now, when Moses is read, there is a veil on their minds. But until their heart leave Moses and look for Christ, then the veil shall be taken. I'm teaching here. If you hear a shout, I hear you. There's a veil on it. When I tell people that Matthew is not New Testament, you can see the shock on their face. They're in shock. How can you say, who are you? How can you, you, when were you born? How can small you be correcting a, the authorized, authorized King James Version? That's the way they look at me. But they forget that holy men speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That means holy men with the Holy Ghost can interpret what holy men wrote. Dibalo, dibalo. This is not a function of CRK. This is a function of revelation. Who are you to say Matthew, but the authorized King James Version? Are you saying that the people that interpreted the Bible, you are smarter than them? Which school did you even attend to start with? Oh, the same question they asked Jesus. They said, he didn't even go to school. 
And he says, he's older than Abraham. See, the day you were born, we were even there. And we know your father more than brothers. And you say, before Abraham was, I am. They carry stones to stone Jesus. They say it's blasphemy. They couldn't stand Jesus. But they didn't know that all of them were in the hands of Jesus. Until you have revelation, you can even slap Jesus and tell him, be careful in Jesus' name. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. Until you have revealed. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Luke 24, 15. <laughs> and it came to pass. Are you following this? That while they communed together and reasoned. They were talking about Jesus. And they were reasoning together. Jesus. Kibatoka. Jesus himself. Not in types and shadows. Himself. The substance. Drew near. And went with them. He entered their team. And he started walking with them. They were talking. He just joined them on the strolling. You know when people stroll. And you meet people on the road. Oh good morning, good morning. We form a team. We continue strolling. Is that true? And then we'll be talking as we're going. And be discussing until we get to our different farms. Everybody will part ways. So Jesus joined in this discussion. And the next verse. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. They were walking with Jesus and talking about Jesus with Jesus, but didn't know Jesus. Don't tell me that if Jesus had asked them a question that made them unhappy, they would not slap him. They would slap him and tell him, what are you talking about? Who are you? Come out from my face. Yes. Go away. Because they didn't know him, so as far as they are concerned, he could be anybody. You can be in church since you were born till you die and never know Jesus. And that's the greatest tragedy that can befall anybody. Because Jesus is not Bible knowledge. Jesus is not CRK, Christian religious knowledge. Jesus is not moral lessons. Jesus is a revelation. Until Jesus is revealed to you, you can know him. And he cannot be revealed until you sit under a man whom he has been revealed to to help you walk along the line where revelation can be made easy. How do you come by revelation? When you sit under the scriptures. Ephesians 3.1 For this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. I have caught the mystery. The mystery I caught, I have written. Okay? Why did I write the mystery that I caught? Next verse. Whereby, when you read you may understand my knowledge where in the mystery of christ so only a man that has encountered christ can help you to get a revelation of christ look at that luke 24 because this is very important to me luke 24 verse 17 very good and he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto him, are thou only a stranger? Are you a stranger? He's talking to Jesus. He's talking to Jesus. Are you in the house? Are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which have come to pass these days? They were talking about the crucifixion of Christ to Christ. They are telling you, you don't know what happened these days to the person that it happened to. You can be in church till you die. Sing the song and clap. I am who I am. I am what he says I am. I never know who you are. <laughs> I am what I am is not a song. It's a revelation. And you know, you can never know who you are until you know who he is. Because the revelation of who you are will be in the unveiling of who he is. When you see him, in him you see you. So until you see him, you are lost. I 
And until you see Jesus, anybody can label you. And any label they give you, you will wear. Like many of you are wearing different labels. Today you wear boss. Who go boss? That's a label. Tomorrow you wear Amani. Is there a label like Georgia Amani? Next tomorrow you wear Dolce and Gabbana. Another tomorrow you wear Max and Spencer. Those are labels. You are not Max and Spencer. But you are wearing Max and Spencer. So you are wearing a label that is not you. That means in dressing, you have allowed somebody dress you the way he wants. Not the way you want. But because you don't have an option, you have accepted his label to be your label. It's colonization. You are colonized. Because you don't have a choice. Well, it looks like what you like. So you wear it. Many people are wearing labels. Doctors say high blood pressure. You wear it. Label. High blood pressure. This my disease has come again. It is now my disease. Who gave you? The doctor told you. You collected the label. Tomorrow. <laughs> Migraine headache. Yeah. I know. When, when it is getting to 9 o'clock, it used to start. You will hear. Bra. When it starts. Bra. One side of my eye. You'll be like, boom, 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 boom. It has come again. Label. How can you collect label? Eh? When you have your own label. What is your own label? If any man be, he is, all things are, behold, all things are, in him, and, and, can he be sick? So you can be sick. So if they put a label of sickness on you, what do you do? Throw it away. I refuse it. That is not me. But you cannot defend you until you know you. And you cannot know you until you know him. And to know him, the scriptures must be unveiled. They were rebuking Jesus, but they didn't know who he was. That your name is Joseph. David. Abraham. Doesn't mean you know Jesus. Even Jesus. Because there's nothing wrong in having a name like Jesus. You can call yourself Jesus. Joshua is Jesus. Joshua. Joshua is Jesus in Hebrew. It's the same thing. There's nothing wrong in bearing Jesus or Joshua. It's the same thing. That you bear Jesus doesn't mean you know Jesus. You must come to a place of revelation. The moment you know Jesus, religion will die. Because religion is not Jesus and Jesus is not religion. That's why Jesus fought religious leaders. Who were the religious leaders? They were called Pharisees and sad to see you see. They were far to see and sad to see who you are in Christ. <laughs> when you tell them I am righteous, they are far to see and sad to see you see. <laughs> Religious leaders couldn't take the radical revelation that Jesus brought. Religion tells you, don't heal on Sabbath day. Don't do anything on Sabbath day. On Sabbath day, don't do anything. Just stay in church. That's religion. So Jesus shows up on Sabbath day and he walks into a place and he says to a sick man, stand up, carry your mat and go. Ah, ah, you have broken the Sabbath. How can you be a righteous person? Jesus said, are you not aware that man is not made for the Sabbath? But the Sabbath is made for man. And I, the son of man, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. That means I can do and undo with the Sabbath. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. And he didn't come to validate a religion. He came to mess up religion and establish a relationship between God and man. Shout, I hear you. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship between God and man. And there are two kinds of relationship. The Old 
Testament relationship and the New Testament relationship. What is the Old Testament relationship? It is man trying to meet up with the standard of God and man cannot. So what is the New Testament relationship? It is God coming down to man and helping man to relate with him. So what the law could not do in that it was with God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin destroyed sin in the flesh that the righteousness of God may be fulfilled in you who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death shout amen somebody born of God born again born of the spirit that's who you are born of God somebody shout I have a relationship with God I know God in Christ Jesus I didn't hear your amen. amen please sit down let's get into a few things here thank you Lord Whew. I say thank you Lord so whenever you find fault in the book of Hebrews he is not talking to New Testament believers he is talking to Old Testament because the Old Testament finds fault the New Testament your sins and iniquities I will remember them again no more Hebrews 9 12 so the book of Hebrews is a comparison between the old and the new testament neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption somebody say eternal redemption somebody shout I have eternal redemption in Christ now when we read the book of Hebrews you will see a lot of once 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 a lot of once is repeated in Hebrews look at verse 13 for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit somebody say I have the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God poured your conscience from dead works to serve the living God look at verse 15 and for this cause he is the mediator of the new testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal so you will see first of all eternal spirit eternal inheritance eternal redemption everything jesus got for us was eternal 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 nothing was temporal nothing was temporal the inheritance was eternal. The spirit was eternal. The salvation was eternal. Nothing was temporal. Amen. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, somebody shout this man. After he had offered how many sacrifices? One sacrifice for sins. Forever. How many sacrifices? For sins, for how long? Every sin that man is capable of committing, Jesus has paid for it. Every sin. He has paid for all sins. In fact, look up. He even paid for the sins of people that live from Adam. Even the sins of people that live from Adam before he came. When he died, he went back in time. Paid for their sin. Paid for the present sin as at when he died. 
and paid for the future sin, including when we will be born. Because none of us was born when Jesus died. So that implies that when he died, that death covered future sin, including our own. Because our sins were in the future. And he died in the past. So if he died in the past and that death covered our sin, it means his death covered future sins and covered past sins and covered present sins. And I have news for you. It doesn't end today. Even our children's 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 sins, that one death covered it. So the death of Jesus paid for sin, past, present, future. God punished the devil. You didn't hear what I said. I said God punished the devil. Not the devil, the devil. That means sin cannot take you to hell. Because it has been paid for. Sin can never stand between you and God. So shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not... That as many of you as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Know ye not? What does it mean to be baptized into Christ? To be born again. It's not water baptism by river or on. Being baptized into Christ means to receive Christ. When Christ enters your heart, it is an immersion. When Christ enters your heart, he covers all of you. He swallows all of you. So when he swallows you, it is called baptism. Because when Christ comes into your heart, he saturates you to a point where it is no longer you that lives. I'm teaching here. He, he swallows you. It's called baptism. You are no more the one living. It's Christ that lives in you. The life that you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God who loves you and gave himself for you. And yet you see church people singing, I surrender. I surrender. Then, when they finish that song, eh? when they finish, nothing left them more. Their car key is still in their pocket. Eh? Their checkbook is still at home. Their TV, their ACs in their houses are still intact. But they have surrendered all. Yeah. Then they will go out and drive their car. Go home and enjoy their AC. But they surrendered all. Who are you foolish? <laughs> you surrendered nothing, my friend. Nothing. You surrendered nothing. If there's anybody that surrendered all, it is Jesus that surrendered all. Who thought not to be in equality with God was robbery, but made himself of no reputation, removed everything, stripped himself of deity, and took upon him the form of a servant, and came down and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Who surrendered all? Exactly. You surrendered nothing. He surrendered all. He surrendered all that you may have all. Glory. He didn't surrender all for you to surrender all. He surrendered all for you to have all. Now that you have all, you are complete. You're complete in Christ who is the head. Of every witch and wizard in your village. Thank you, Jesus. That's a good place to wave your hands and give him thanks. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Hebrew teaches us very clearly without ambiguity. From all the readings we have read, if you follow carefully, without ambiguity, Hebrews tells you, number one, you are saved forever. Is that true? Now, can I hear you shout it very loud? I am saved forever. Number two, Hebrews teaches you, you are perfected forever. Is that true? So, can I hear you shout, I am perfected forever. Number three, Hebrews tells you, you are sanctified once and for all. Is that true? 
So I want you to shout, I am sanctified once and for all. If it's clear, somebody shout, it is clear. Hebrews 10, 38. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hold it. Look at me. From everything I taught you from background to where I am now. Does that scripture apply to you? Who is saved forever? Wait, who is saved forever? Who is sanctified forever? Who is perfected forever? So does this scripture now address you? Why? Huh? 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 You can never draw back. So that means when he's talking about my, your soul draw back, he wasn't talking to Christians. He was addressing a group. That's why sometimes in two verses, those two verses are not addressing one group. It's addressing two groups of people. How do we know that? So look at 38. He is addressing a group of people that is not you. Then look at verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving. Is 39 talking to you? Is 38 talking to you? No. Because the writer of Hebrews was addressing believing Jews and non-believing Jews. So you will see those kind of things in between each other as you read the scriptures. And I'm laying this one because I'm going to get into some very crazy, crazy part of this book of Hebrews to help you understand so that there is clarity in the doctrine of salvation where you are concerned. Say I hear. Say I hear. All right, Hebrews 11 verse 2. Can we all read together a very loud one to go? For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Who obtained a good report? Are you the elders? Huh? Are you the elders? Who are the elders? The Old Testament people. Abel, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Rahab. All of them are the elders. They obtained good report through this faith that Hebrews is describing. And to show you that this faith is not New Testament faith, to show you that it's not talking about Christians of the New Testament here, in this same context, in the course of this same discourse, look at verse 39 of Hebrews 11. And this all, having obtained what? A good report through faith, receive not the promise. You see that? They got the report, but they didn't get the promise. But you have the promise. You are not, you are not hearing. They didn't get the promise, but we got the promise. Who is the promise? Jesus. They are types and shadows. We have substance. Keep the kaboda, kaboda. They ate bread and rabina in the wilderness and they died. We don't eat bread and rabina. We eat Jesus. We live forever. I'm teaching good. They were baptized in water. And with some of them, God was not pleased. We are not baptized in water. We are baptized in the spirit. That which is born of flesh. That which is born of spirit. That's what John the Baptist, the last prophet. How many of you know that John the Baptist is the last prophet of the Old Testament? You know that? Okay, let's have some of you. The New Testament didn't start in Matthew. The New Testament started in Acts of the Apostles. Technically. Okay? Technically. But for the purpose of translators, to make it easy for you, they included the transition books in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are transition books because Egebo Dagaba Dogeba. Gongo Logogo. When I speak like this, you better speak your own because something is happening. <laughs> the New Testament started in Acts of the Apostles. How do we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were transition books and they are not New Testament? Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. 
But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Made where? So when Jesus came, what was he? He was under. So that means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are under. That means they are part of the Old Testament. I don't know if I'm teaching here. If you understand, they say, I hear, I hear. Matthew 26, 28, to further buttress this fact. For this is my blood. My what? Blood of the... So until the blood of Jesus was poured out, there was no New Testament. So the New Testament is in the blood. And the blood was not shed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Where was the blood shed? At the end of John. After the blood was shed, what was the next book that was written? Acts. That's why Acts chapter 1 says, after his resurrection. So after he died and shed his blood, when he rose, the first account of his resurrection is Acts of the Apostles. So where is the New Testament? Acts to Revelation. Somebody says, uh -uh. I can give you more to butterize the fact. Should we butterize? Hebrews 9.16 For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Next verse. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. End of discussion. I'm teaching good here. So, there will be no New Testament until the testator died. So it was after Jesus died. When he rose, a New Testament started. Where is that? Acts of the apostles. But I have news for you. The New Testament is not the testament of a dead testator. <laughs> Woo -wee! The New Testament is not a testament of a dead testator. You see, the testator died and gave back to the New Testament. Then he rose to defend the testament. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. If you're hearing me shout, I hear. Sit down and follow. You know, in the natural, in the natural, when a father is about to die, he writes his will and hands over to a lawyer to protect the testament. Okay, when Jesus was to die, nobody he could not trust anybody in, in, to start with self. Nobody could help him, nobody was of any contribution. So, to start with, it was the exclusive work of God to save man. So, when he died, he didn't give any man to help to defend. So, he had to rise and he became the, 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 the advocate. He became the advocate general of the church. If any man seen, we have an. If I'm teaching good, shout I hear. He rose from the dead and became the advocate general of his testament. And he told the devil, shut up. I was the one that finished you and I am the one defending them. When the devil say you are not qualified, Jesus will say, shut up, I qualify him. I qualify him, I qualify him. And it's not just the advocate general, he is the judge. He is the advocate, he is the judge. The chief judge. So when the devil accuses you, Jesus tells him, shut up. On what basis? This man is acquitted and discharged. He's not just granted pardon. He's not granted pardon. He's acquitted and discharged. These are two different things. No record, that's right. Acquitted, discharged. If they granted you pardon, it means you are actually a criminal. It's just an act of compassion. The judge decided to grant you pardon, but your records are still there. But when you are acquitted and discharged, it means the case has been squashed. There is nothing to reference to next time. 
It means in that court of law, all those documents that concern that case are wiped out. Wiped out. Destroyed. So tomorrow, if anybody makes reference to that case, the court can grab him for character assassination. Because as far as the court of justice is concerned, this man stands justified. In the sight of God, there is no record against you. You stand justified. You are forgiven forever. If your amen slaps the devil, you are the righteous man of God. Somebody shout, I'm justified. Somebody shout, I'm forgiven. Acquitted and discharged. Right now, I stand before God without guilt, condemnation, or righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. My record is clean. Amen. Amen. Woo! I feel like dancing. If you are the one understanding what I'm teaching, let your amen slap the devil. So because you are righteous before God, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time. As you will stand and shout amen, every need in your life right now, I release help. Receive help. Receive help. Receive help. Throughout this week, every second, every hour of the day, I come my help to come from every direction. Amen. Things you were struggling with, and things that were not working for you, and things that were not responding to you, by virtue of the finished work of Christ, by virtue of what Jesus has done on your behalf, I command every evil record and every evil thing standing against you, destroyed right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. You are justified. You are sanctified. You are accepted in the beloved. Shout yes. Stand with me. Don't sit again because I'm done. Hebrews 11.40. Look at it. God having provided some better thing for us. That they without us should not be made perfect. All them Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's why today we don't say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, we don't pray that kind of prayer anymore. Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob want our God. You don't understand. I'm no more waiting for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, no, no. If the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was good enough, they would have entered rest. But the Bible says, after all that they did, they could not enter. But God having provided some better thing we are better than them if your amen is better your life will be brighter amen. somebody shout this is a better day a better me and a better future under jesus my high priest can i hear your amen, amen. god having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect they without us cannot be made perfect because we are in a better dispensation. What has God provided for us that is better? The blood of Jesus. And number two, he has perfected us. They were not perfected, but we are perfected. They were not perfected because animal blood cannot perfect you. But we are perfected because what we have is the blood of Jesus. And this blood of Jesus has perfected us. As we stand now, we stand perfect before God. With all your mistakes, God doesn't see them. He sees Christ. And in Christ, there is no mistake. Am I teaching good? Before God, you stand perfect. Before God, you stand complete. Before God, you stand righteous. And before God, you stand without a record of evil. So Hebrews 12, 18. Look at this as I pray. For you are not come unto the mount. Somebody say, I am not come unto the mount. Uh -huh. There are some mountains you shouldn't go. You didn't hear. Now your voice is small. You didn't hear. There are some mountains you shouldn't go. You are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that born with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet 
and the voice of words which voice they that had entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore for they could not endure that which was commanded and if so much as a beast touch the mountain it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart and so terrible was the sight that Moses himself said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion. Somebody shout, I have come. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Look at this. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written where in heaven who are those written in heaven if you're written in heaven wave your hand and shout i'm in the number and to god the judge of all and to the spirits where are those just men made perfect you are right here next verse next verse and to we have come to who who have we come to and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh do you know the meaning of better things than the blood of Abel the blood of Abel was not Abel's blood the blood of Abel was that animal sacrifice the blood of Abel is the animal sacrifice and the blood of Abel is Jesus blood the blood of Abel was animal sacrifice. The blood of Abel is Jesus' blood. May God give you understanding. The blood of Abel was animal sacrifice. But the blood of Abel is Jesus' blood. So the blood of Abel is better than the blood of Abel. <laughs> glory. I say glory. Yeah, the Old Testament people use animals. It was inferior to the blood of Christ. So listen to me. What happened to them cannot happen to you. Your case is different. You are not Samson. You are not Delilah. You are in Christ. You are not sanguine. You are not melancholy. You are not introvert. You are not extrovert. You are not phlegmentine. A choleric. What of the other one that is like phlegmentine? <laughs> eh? Phlegmatic. You know, some people say, I'm phlegmatic. How can you be phlegmatic in Christ? Is Christ phlegmatic? What Christ is not, I'm not. What Christ is, I am. Because as he is. Kebato, kebato, kebata. Jizajo ketebaha. Somebody say, I am not come to that mountain. But I am come to Zion. You know the other mountain is called Sinai. Sinai is a Mount Sinai. Anything that touch the mountain will die. Even Moses, the coordinator of the mountain, say, "I am trembling. My body is quaking because what can come out of this mountain is unpredictable." But we are come to Mount Zion. <laughs> Glory to God! <laughs> I feel like I'm teaching good here. We are come to Mount Zion. I prophesy in Mount Zion there is deliverance. Everything that is your own that has been captured, I deliver it to you. You are in Zion. You are not in Sinai. Every good thing that Jesus died for, as your amen will come like thunder, as your two hands will be lifted up in a position to collect, every good thing that Jesus died for, receive now. Receive now. Receive now. Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, his blood is speaking for you. He's speaking favor. He's speaking blessing. He's speaking progress. He's speaking success. The blood is speaking your perfection. In the mighty name of Jesus, I decree by the finished work of Christ, he died that you may live. Everything in your body that is dying, everything around your business and career that is dying, I command dry bones come alive. Receive resurrection. Receive resurrection. Receive resurrection. If the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwelleth in your mortal body, that same spirit shall quicken your mortal body. I command every organ of your body that is misbehaving or collapsing, come alive. Your bones come alive. Your blood be healed. Your tendons be healed. Your tissue be healed. I command your brain be restored. I command the work of your hands come alive. 
I cause every hold of the devil over you broken. Satan, get your hands off. Get your hands off. Get your hands off. In the name of Jesus. I decree by the power of the Holy Spirit, beginning from this service, every delayed manifestation in your life is released now. This week, receive miracles. 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 And throughout this week, anybody trying to make trouble around you, I command trouble to trouble their trouble. Anybody bringing problem to make you unhappy, I command a bigger problem to hit their problem. Let me tell you, when people tell you you will see, it is not final. Don't be intimidated by the sharpness of people's mouth. People can finish sharp mouth and drop dead. Don't be afraid of man. He has said that I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid what man can do to me. Somebody say, I hear you. There's always somebody can threaten you like this. And as he gets some police will arrest him. And they will carry him and his wife and leave only the children who can do nothing. And lock him up. And lock him up. And after three days, they release him and apologize. And they will tell him it was a mistaken identity. And he can do nothing about it. But at least you have relaxed for three days. And as he's coming back, another trouble can hit him. They come back and pick him again. And tell him, somebody just reported you now. Trouble pass trouble. Don't be afraid of trouble. Because you are wired to solve problems. Say, I hear you. Say, from my head to my leg. I am wired to deal with troubles. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of anything. And listen to me, when it looks like no hope for you, that's when all the hope is available. If there's anybody you are expecting to help you, take your eyes from them. Because when you keep looking at one person for help, that person may not be the person God wants to use. And because you're focusing there, when the right people are coming from other angles, you won't see them. So remove your eye from people and just be, be expectant. It can come from anywhere. Anything can happen at any... Be full of expectation. Now I decree as you are full of expectation, this week, your expectation shall not be cut off. It shall not be cut off. I release miracles. 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 In the name of Jesus. Lift your hands and begin to praise God and receive all the miracles, healings, testimonies. Just go ahead and begin to praise. Begin to praise. Begin to praise. I'm not hearing your voices. I'm not hearing your voices. I'm not hearing your voices. Begin to praise him. Begin to praise him. Begin to praise him. Hagaboja kele nebosa. Kalamonga. Karadoge. Genebosa. Praise him for making a way for you where there is no way. Praise him for moving people, moving systems. Praise him for moving opportunities. And praise him for moving governments and banks. Praise him for moving companies and corporations. Praise him for moving international bodies to think of you and look for you. Praise him for using even your enemies to favor you. Just praise him for making ways for you all over the place. Give him praise. 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 Mota lo ba toke bolo toke mahanda. Ila baba baba roto kibala na mama mohoria. Engre nango kere ne moka ele bojoka ele baroko ele mareke ele baloka badagade ge boya takana kabaho ele bojaka radagaga. It is done. In the mighty name of Jesus. Can I hear that amen on a note of finality? How many of you are expecting great things this week? Beginning from this service. Are you expecting? I'm expecting you to come with testimonies. If that amen is louder, your own has started. 